Hey everyone, it's Jason. It's the 124th episode of the Fretboard Journal Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we have a fun episode for you. We are taking a break from some of the Fretboard Summit content we've been sharing over the last couple of weeks. Uh, we have an interview with John Harrington, the guitarist for Steely Dan, an exceptional player, needless to say, if he's playing with Steely Dan, uh, as well as just an all-around great guy. We've interviewed him before for our website. I wanted to talk to him a little bit about the record he came out with earlier this year, Adult Entertainment, as well as about what gear he is using when he's playing Steve with Steely Dan and a bunch more. So we had a fun chat. It's going to happen in just a few minutes. I do want to say thank you so much for all the great feedback about the Fretboard Summit's uh, content. Thank you so much for the handful of you guys who actually posted reviews for us on iTunes. Those help out a lot. I hope the rest of you will take 10 seconds out of your day to uh, leave us a star rating on iTunes if you've been enjoying our podcast. And uh, I hope you will also, obviously, subscribe to this podcast. Fretboard Journal 37 has been mailing. Folks are digging it. Uh, Nels Klein, I think, sees it tomorrow. I hope he enjoys it because he's on the cover. Uh, we have copies here if anyone is looking for it. Uh, so much cool stuff in that in, in that issue. Uh, obviously, Nels, the feature on Joe Yanya's Yellow, um, Margaret Glassby, and so much more. So check that out if you uh, want to. You can get that at fretboardjournal.com. And I should say, because it is November and December and folks are starting to think about gift buying if you haven't done it already, uh, the Fretboard Journal makes for a great gift, and we do offer one- and two-year gift subscriptions to all of your guitar friends from around the world. So uh, if you need a gift, it's an easy one, and we'll send you, uh, or we'll send the recipient, I should say, a really cool postcard telling them that they got it, and then they'll get the next issue, which we'll be mailing out in uh, early January. Also, I want to mention a couple cool things on our website right now. We just posted a very cool article on the very first lore mandolin ever made. Walter Carter of Carter Vintage penned that for us. Stephen Gilchrist did the restoration on that instrument. That's going to be appearing in Fretboard Journal 38 as well, but we decided to just kind of get that out so that as many eyeballs could see it as humanly possible. We also have a great interview that I just did with Grant Gordy. Uh, stellar guitarist, former podcast guest. Uh, he and Ross Martin have an album out called Year of the Dog, which we just cannot stop playing. It is one of the finest sounding guitar duo records I've heard in a long time, and uh, it's probably under most people's radar because uh, these sorts of projects tend to be, so I encourage anyone to check it out. It's on Bandcamp as well as uh, Amazon and probably iTunes as well. All right, so uh, this podcast, which you're about to listen to, is brought to you like many of the last few podcasts from our friends at T.R. Crandall Guitars, T-R-C-R-A-N-D-A-L-L.com. So much cool stuff on their site. Uh, as you are window shopping and thinking about stuff for the holidays, I encourage you guys to go over there. They are one of the most respected vintage guitar stores around, as well as one of the most vin- uh, respected vintage repair shops around. Uh, I'm eyeing so much cool stuff. They've got a pair of D'Angelicos that they just added to their site. They're the real vintage D'Angelicos, not the new ones. Uh, they've got a 1945 Gibson LG2 banner guitar that looks amazing. If you've been reading about banner guitars through John Thomas's writings or that book Kalamazoo Gals or just through our website and want to hear what the fuss is about, that's, that's probably your best ticket in there. Um, they've got cool K guitars. They've got so much stuff. Uh, I, just, I just love perusing their website, and I hope you will too. That's trcrandall.com. All right, we're going to get to the interview with John Harrington. I do want to say this interview was done a few weeks ago, right in the midst of a Beacon Theater run for Steely Dan. So uh, you get to hear a little bit about what goes into their live rig setup, as well as a bunch more. And John Harrington's CD, once again, is called Adult Entertainment. And if you do a web search, I'm sure you'll find it. It is very good. Thanks so much for tuning in. Happy holidays, everybody. I'll talk to you next Friday. So, John, are you guys playing the Beacon Theater tomorrow? We are. We have uh, four more shows this week. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday, Saturday. And uh, are you all set up there and everything, or is there load-in tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, no, we've been set up. Um, Unfortunately, after the first show, I think the the band had to load out, and it's a particularly grueling loadout because it's such an old theater. Um, because they had another show in there the next day or something. But uh, I think we've been able to, st- since then, I think they've been able to basically keep it set up. They just had Seinfeld in there one night and had to push things to the back of the stage. But <laughs> Put some sheets over the amps. Yeah, they just put a curtain up or something. <laughs> so, so it's 
Not too bad. So I want to ask you about uh, Adult Entertainment, the new record, but I also uh, walk me through what, what your rig looks like when you play with Steely Dan. Oh, sure. Um, it's pretty simple. Um, I'm, I have, I think I have f- five guitars out there with me now. It's, um, I mostly play the Gibson CS336, which I've been playing for years. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, the, the guitar that gets the next most time is probably the, a, a custom shop SG I bought a few years ago. And then um, there's a, Weiss, a Larry Wysocki made telly that I play a bit and an old Fender telly with a middle pickup installed that uh, gets a little time. And once in a while, um, a sort of shrunken 335, a little like the 336 that Eastman uh, guitars made and uh it's a nice guitar as well so it's those five guitars and um let's see the pedal board if i can remember correctly uh it goes there's a kind of a wacky uh volume uh, i mean wawa pedal that is kind of a modified crybaby and i'm actually not sure who did the mods on it um but it's it's kind of cool because there's no on off switch you just it, it uh you put your foot on it and it just starts working and then you take your foot off and it reverts back to bypass mode, you know, so it's pretty cool. Um, I find myself using it a little more because it's so, you know, so easy to access or something. Um, and then I have a Hilton volume pedal in the line uh, where there's a, a Korg tuner that's out of one of the outputs of that and then the the... the Signal, the guitar signal goes to, let's see, uh, what does it go to next? Oh, there's a uh, one of those uh, RC boost pedals that, um, you know, what's that name, that company it makes? Um, you know the one I'm talking about, right? It's a white one. It's uh, exotic effects, yeah. Yeah. And I use that only when I switch to and when i have to play a solo on the rhythm pickup i kick that in because it it uh takes some i cut some lows with the it's got good eq on it so i cut some lows and i i boost some highs and i don't use the gain and i keep the volume set sort of at unity gain so basically it just sort of hits the amp uh with a little less low end and uh you know adds a little top end so it uh because I kind of set the amp for the a solo sound on the treble pickup, you know, and uh, so when I'm soloing on the rhythm pickup, I'll sometimes step on that, which kind of corrects the EQ basically without having to go back to the amp and redial things in. Uh, and then it goes to uh, just a, a clean boost pedal. I'm forgetting the I'm forgetting the company that makes it because it's, it's sort of a strange name. Okay. Um, but it, uh, I use that when I switch to one of the Fender style guitars because they have so much lower output that they don't hit the amp as hard. So it's just, so a lot of these things are just sort of little practical fixes to get the level and the EQ right on the way to the amp. And I, then the signal goes to the input of uh, a Gytron FV, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Gytron uh, GT100 FV. And I have two of those, one's a spare and one's, you know the the active one and there's a loop in 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 the loop i have let's see a couple different things um strymon makes this kind of uh tape uh imitator sort of um it's it's got two effects sort of in it one's a tape saturation effect and the other one is a delay and i use a, a very like kind of a very low mix level of a, sl- a slight slap back, just a single repeat of a of a dark toned delay uh, on one of the effects of it. And then the other th- the other thing is sort of it does sort of tape saturate or tape compression imitates tape compression. And uh, I have it very subtly set, but it it does something very nice. And uh, and then there's a Boss uh, reverb pedal in the loop as well. So just those two things in the loop. And I leave them on all the time, and uh, so there's not much that that uh, gets not much that changes. I have a there's a channel switching pedal on the board as well, which changes the Gytron uh, from the cleaner 
channel to the dirtier channel. And um, so that's that's kind of all. It's um, I mean, there's a number of number of uh, effects, but I don't. It's it's pretty. It feels sort of like playing pretty much just into one or the other of the amp channels. It's pretty pretty simple and straightforward. Not a lot of bells and whistles, really. And did uh, did you have much feedback from Donald Fagan on tone and and what sounds they were going for, or is this kind of just your rig? It's been evolved over the years and kind of your deal. Uh, it's really my deal. Uh, they they are unusual in uh, as employers in my experience in that they have almost never told me uh, you know how to how to play something or what to play or. You know, I almost get no instructions at all from them. I mean, over the years, I can ima- I can remember maybe one or two times where where some somebody said something. The 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 familiar story, the famous story that I tell is uh, is the one time um, we hadn't played Hey Nineteen in many years, and and we played it at Soundcheck because Donald wanted to put it in the show that night, and. And so we just we just started it, and uh, there's a little intro, a beautiful little uh, guitar melody on the intro, and I I sort of forgot it. I had forgotten it, and I I just sort of improvised something and tried to get as close as I could, but I didn't. I wasn't happy with it. And I I had already decided I was going to have to go listen to the record and make sure I brushed up on it because I I like to play what's on the record there because it sort of feels like a signature part, you know. Sure. So. Uh, so uh, at the end of that tune, Donald gets up from the piano. He kind of, kind of walks over to me, and he's got his head down, and he, he looks a little reluctant to say anything. But he, he says, "Hey, man, you know that, that beginning, that beginning line on the, on the beginning of this tune." And then he's, he stops himself, and he waves his hand. He says, "Ah, forget it." And he turns around. <laughs> <laughs> now I don't know whether he just assumed I would take care of it or. Or that maybe he thought he was being too nitpicky or something, but uh, but yeah, it had already registered for me, and I was gonna gonna sort of go back and learn it anyway. <laughs> so, but you know that's 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 a, a typical example. I mean, he, he that's the only time he's even come close to saying anything about what I should play, and so he's basically uh, trusted me. They both trusted me with the, with the job, and uh, and I've I've had to make my own decisions, but um you know I'm, I'm very happy having done it, and clearly. Uh, they're not unhappy with the choices I've made over the years because this is year 16 for me with this band. Congratulations. So it's all right, you know. So something's working. So. You, you guys tour a lot, but when you're not touring, are you still getting together as a band or it just kind of you just wait no. till the gigs? No. No, it's it's we're really just hired uh on a on a project basis either a, either a record or a tour and lately it's been every year a tour, which has been fabulous. We picked up the pace. When I first started working with them, we were averaging a tour every three years and uh so now i think it's the last four years have been on years for the band so i guess they don't want to put it down and they're afraid they won't pick it up again if yeah they yeah <laughs> well and you tour with a lot of other folks but uh how did this solo record or the trio record come about well uh, we had I, I sort of been in the habit of making uh records with my band um since the year 2000, when uh, I first decided it was worth spending some money of my own to, to sort of put a record together, it was it was the first year I was touring with Steely Dan. I thought it might be nice to have a little, uh, you know, personal sort of CD as a as a as a sort of enhanced calling card, you know, and sure. uh, and we had been working together for a long time and writing songs together for for many years before that, and. Uh, so I knew we had the material for a record uh, back then, and, I, and we made the first one. And, and then it was about ten years, I think it was ten years. That was that record was called Like So, and the next one was Shine, 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 which, which took another ten years for me to get get out. And um, right around that time, I hired an assistant to help me with a lot of the sort of grunt work of. Uh, doing my own band and trying to book it and and trying to you know get the records out there and selling them and doing the social networking and the website stuff so uh and then the pace of writing and record making started to pick up and we did a we did a record called time on my hands i think uh maybe only like i don't know maybe three years after shine 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 came out so and then i think it's i think it was maybe four years uh later uh we were we just released adult entertainment and 
actually that record kind of came about pretty organically because when we were we had done time on my hands and uh, we had been doing a lot of gigs in support of that record trying to sell it and uh and because we were we were playing so much we we started to get a, a sense of which tunes were going over with the audience and what types of tunes were working and i i think we just kind of learned a lot about how to sort of narrow the focus of the of the writing to sort of you know make it good for the live show and and so when those gigs sort of dried up and we had, we had done all of them that I wanted to do, um, Dennis, the bass player, uh, you know, had an idea for a tune and, and we, we got together just kind of casually on a weekend and, and, uh, came up with a song and finished it over the course of the next couple of days. And then, uh, you know, we, we were, we were, we sort of had a, sort of an idea of the type of song we were trying to write and and then he had another idea for another one and we we got together again the next week and and I don't know before I before I knew it I mean I wasn't thinking of making another record um we were really just coming off the uh the the sort of you know the gigging that we had done in support of the last one but uh I don't know within a, within a couple of months we had a enough tunes so I said hmm, well maybe we have a record's worth of music here and then the nice thing about it for me was there was something about the lyric writing because Dennis and I were doing all of it and we were kind of thinking in, this, in, in a certain way and we were we were thinking about how the stuff would work live and trying to make sure that it would come off well that way uh, there was something about the lyric writing particularly that was sort of hanging together in a way that songs on all the other records uh, never really did for me and so I don't know, just one day I said, well, you know what, I think we're just going to have to make another record. And it felt like it was in a hurry at the time. And uh, we, the writing was the sort of easy part and the fun part. And then, uh, and because I was working so much and out of town so much, um, the actual recording of the record kind of happened in, in like the small spurts that I was home. We did the tracking once and then months later I began to overdub on it. Then months later we got to, we got around to mixing it and all that. So it, it you know, it, it was a slow, it wasn't, it wasn't actually slow. We didn't take that long to do it, but it was spread out over several years because, we, you know, because I was so much, I spent so much time on the road. So. And are you able to do lyric writing on the road or do you kind of need a, a private place to do that? Uh, you know, I typically don't do much writing on the road. Um, I, I guess I, I have in the past a, a little at, at times, but um, no, lately I'm not one of those guys who who is so overflowing with like lyrical ideas that uh, that I have to sort of you know write every day or anything. Or and I'm not I'm not I'm not such a dedicated writer that I I make it a like a daily practice or anything like that. You know I I uh, there was a time when I, I I toyed with that, but lyrics have always been a lot harder for me to come up with uh, than music, um, and they seem to sort of require. A, a good idea and for me lately the collaborating with Dennis has really helped because it's it's kind of helped motivate me because um you know I I mean I like I like um putting the tunes together for a record I I, I have enjoyed that but once the record's done I uh, I haven't been you know I'm not I'm not sort of writing tunes all the time um and uh I don't know if that'll change or not but that's been the way it's been for the last couple of records at least so and uh, when you went in to finally record these songs, was it the Gibson again? Uh, I used a bunch of different guitars. Yeah. I did play the Gibson on a few things uh, in the tracking, um, and you know, there's we 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 did track the three of us, uh, drums, bass, and guitar, um, for all of these tunes. And but but then over the over the year over the months that we worked on the overdubs, especially, uh, there are several of the tunes where where some of the guitar didn't survive, you know, I mean, the original guitar, and I, I replaced it with, uh, with either better parts or better sound or a different sound as things evolved, you know. There's a lot that did stay, but, um, but, uh, but there's quite a lot of guitar that was added in the overdub phase, too, which, which I always enjoy. And, uh, but on the tracking, I did play the, the 336 a bit, and I played a Gretsch on a few tunes, um, this old '60s Gretsch that I bought from a guitar repair guy that works on my stuff, and uh, it's, a, it's a fun guitar, and it worked for some of the sort 
style of a couple of these tunes. And um, I don't know what else. Maybe a maybe a telly. There, there definitely are some tellies on the right. That Waisaki telly is on several of those tunes because that was sounding great. And uh, the SG is on a couple of the uh, as an overdub guitar is on there. And then there's some sort of like special instruments there's a national tricone uh, resonator guitar on on the opening track might over matter there's there might be an electric 12 string on that one too uh i might have put the sitar guitar i have on something you know just for for sort of like you know a little sonic candy yeah uh, not much else but uh so yeah but but you know mostly Mostly the bulk of the guitar work were, were my go-to three guitars, the same ones I play live all the time, the 336, the SG, and that Waisaki Telly. What's, this, what's the story with the Waisaki Telly? I, I'm not familiar with that guy. Yeah, he's a, he's, a, well, he's a wood dealer and has been for 40 years or so, I think. And he's an L.A.-based guy, and I think he supplies wood for a lot of uh, you know, these, these you know, one-man companies that you know these great luthiers i think mostly for acoustic guitars maybe even for classical guitars sure. but but he's you know he he makes lots of trips scouring the world for great wood and so he has a great supply i know and he makes a fabulous uh very vintage sounding uh telly that, that people rave about and um and i've had one for i don't know maybe it's three years or so now and uh it's just, you know, you know, brand new. The thing, it's just ringing, and and it just it sounds old and beautiful and in the best way. And it, you know, of course, it's brand new, and he does great work. So it's it plays plays beautifully, and it just has a ring and a and a, a, a liveliness that uh, I, I've never never had in the telly. It's just, it's fabulous. So uh, yeah, he's just um, one of these unusual finds. You know, they're uh, they're uh, highly regarded and i don't think there are too many of them and how did you find out about him it was through a friend uh my friend kenny up in uh connecticut uh, had one and uh, was raving about it and I, I got to play it on a gig up there once uh he lent it to me and uh the only mod i made uh made larry do was to add string trees up on the on the uh headstock because when i borrowed uh kenny's uh instrument um i I got overzealous with a bend on uh, the high E string, I think, and it came out of the nut slot. You know? <laughs> so uh, I said, "Oh no, this is not good," you know. So, but uh, and and Larry somewhat reluctantly agreed to put uh, string trees on there for me. <laughs> because, nice, because I had that accident. But he didn't like because he doesn't like to mess with it at all. You know, he's a, he's a purist about the the wood, and you know, the, the fewer things you screw into it, the better for him, I think. But uh, he accommodated me, and and it's a, it's a great guitar. It's a fun guitar to play. And and being a wood dealer, is this like exotic wood, or is this just a simple uh, ash or maple? Well, telling? I yeah. think I think it's pretty good wood. I mean, I know it's good wood. It sounds fantastic. I think. Uh, one, I don't know, there might be some maple on the neck, I think might have come from, I don't know, deep in Lake Michigan from some sure. like some boat or something. <laughs> sure. One of those stories? I think these guys, yeah, it's some funny story. I wish I remembered the t t details more. but uh, And I think there's there's some kind of swamp ash you know, body. I don't really know where it came from. But uh, no, I I trusted him to pick pick the right thing. And uh, it, it like I said, it's it's so alive sounding. It's it's remarkable. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious. You, you've got uh, you know this solo career. You've got this new record out. You've got the higher profile Steely Dan stuff. Do you still take on the little odds and end gigs, the little session work things that uh, nobody ever talks about? <laughs> Occasionally, yeah. um, although I have less and less time to do it because this year I think the road work has added up to I think over six months. I was averaging about six months a year for the last couple of years, and then this one I think is is uh, actually tipping into that area of more time away than at home, which which I'm not sure I love, uh, but it's all work I, I love to do, so I don't want to say no to. It's mostly a combination of uh, working with uh, Steely Dan um, and a singer named Madeline Peru, who sure. I've worked with for 10 or 11 years now, and, and she, she likes to work a lot and we travel a lot. So um, that that's mm -hmm. that really is the bulk of my work um but no i still i still will do a little project here and there uh most of them now are are and i try to i try to engineer it this way um rather than going to a session at a studio i 
I, uh, I have people send me stuff, you know, send me tracks and because I have a studio, a little studio of my stuff that I share with Jim Beard, the keyboard player in uh, Steely Dan and an old buddy of mine. Um, and you know, I have a, an ISO booth where I can, you know, put it, put a, a guitar cabinet and I have all my guitars here, all my amps and, you know, I have good mics and, you know, a good mic, a couple good mic pre's and good converters. So I, I can do like high quality guitar overdubbing here. We couldn't record like a drum kit in a, you know, in any kind of professional way here. And we don't try to do that, but this is, but it's a great thing for, it's a great overdub studio. And, you know, so I have people send me tracks and then I just, uh, you know, I, I add, add guitar tracks and, you know, sh- you know, send them back on the internet. And, uh, so it's, it's, it's a great way to do it. Cause I, you know, you know I don't have any, producer breathing down my neck i can do it when i'm in the mood when and and if i have the urge to try a different effect or a different guitar you know it's it's right here you know i don't have to uh say oh i wish i'd brought that guitar i wish i'd brought that effect you know that's what happens when you go to the studio sometimes so uh yeah i I still i love to do that and um because i'm away so much i don't do as much of it as i used to And and i do some teaching when i'm home too and sometimes even uh you know, online, I can do a Skype lesson with somebody. Yeah, you're still so, doing those? Yeah, yeah, once in a while. There's a handful of students that seem to want to stay in touch with me, which is very nice. <laughs> yeah. What's your uh, What's your survival strategy for being on the road that long? Do you have a, a routine? Uh, yeah, sort of. I mean, uh, I, I kind of, I mean, I mean, I've been, I mean, for the last 16 years, I've been out so much uh, that, that uh, I've, I've I've realized that in some ways, you know, I I have more I have more free time when I'm uh, away than I do when I'm home. You know, I mean, it 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 is a kind of a simplifier of of my life. You know, when I'm away, because there's there's really just the single responsibility when you're away, and when you're home, you're always juggling things. You know, there's 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 often social obligations, family obligations. Uh, you know, that's where your residence is, so you you know you're busy with. Stuff like that. I've got the studio as well as a residence, so you know, there's there's always a lot to do and lots of stuff, you know, and and um, you know, there's there's a there's a liberating kind of thing about being on the road, and I, I find I read more, I have I get more exercise, and uh, you know, I just have more general more generally more time to myself. So uh, so I, I I do like that part of it. I, I if it's too many uh, if it's too long, I I can get a little stir crazy and go get a little restless and, and anxious to be home. But, uh, but, um, yeah, mostly, um, I've got my, you know, my morning routine. I usually try to find a coffee shop. That's a good walk, a good one, but a good walk away. So I get a little, a little exercise in the morning sure. and I'll, uh, I'll sometimes get on the treadmill and I'll, uh, you know, I'll, uh, do some regular sort of like, uh, exercise in the room and just just sort of stretching and posture sort of exercise stuff which kind of keeps my left arm in check because i've had some issues with uh you know some injury issues that have uh that do affect my playing and uh try to keep them at bay and the, the stretching and it's, it's kind of like similar to yoga and posture exercise kind of stretches and things like that but uh that, so that seems necessary and and helpful and i think it kind of gives me a the, a little bit of a routine does sort of keep me a little more on track you know yeah and are you home for a, a little while now well not too long <laughs> yeah we, uh, we've been i've been home for uh actually most of september i was home uh with the exception of maybe a, about a 10-day trip with madeline peru to promote a new cd she has out um but then, then I've been home for the month of October to do this little Steely Dan mini residency at the Beacon Theater. Uh, but that ends on Saturday, and then the following Wednesday, November second, I I travel to uh, for for another tour with Madeline Peru, which I think we do about two and a half or three weeks. I'm home for a day or two, and then we go to Europe for another three weeks. So, so I've still got another six weeks <laughs> before the year's <laughs> touring is done, which is what's like i said tipping the balance over the 50 percent mark yeah. this year i don't know how <laughs> you do it it's a lot you know but i don't know i'm i'm, I'm kind of used to it and uh I, I certainly prefer it to uh the empty calendar I, I i do like working i gotta say i'm a little i'm 
maybe a little too much. I mean, it could be, uh, I have, that could be my, my, uh, it, my, my job may be to learn how to be less busy as I, <laughs> as, as I get older, you know, when the, when the phone stops ringing, <laughs> some of this work dries up and I don't want to do more. I have to learn how to have more free time and use it well, but I'm, I'm getting better at that. Actually. I'm taking vacations occasionally for the first time, you know, <laughs> you're like a civilian. Yeah, almost. You know, the, you know, traveling has been such a great way to, uh, you know, I mean, it's it's sort of like paid vacation. Days off are like paid vacation for me. And I was, uh, when I was younger, whenever I tried to take a vacation, I'd be okay for the first two or three days. And then, then I just want to be working again. I'd want to have a guitar in my hands and I want to be playing music again. And so I was always, I, I was reluctant to take vacations, you know, and, uh, but the road is perfect that way. You know, if you have some time off and you can, you know, be in some, some place you don't know well, and it's worth exploring. Uh, when it is worth exploring, it's 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 the best way to to uh, see a place for me. But uh, but you know, I'm I'm getting a little. Uh, I'm starting to enjoy my uh, time away from the guitar a little more than I used to, which is which is definitely new for me. <laughs> but it's okay. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much for talking. Uh, the new record's fantastic. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I'm uh, glad you're enjoying it. I appreciate you checking it out. I have uh, not heard the other two, but uh, I don't know. It sounds like you like this one the best. Well, I suppose, you know, you. yeah, I mean, there's, there's something nice about that. I mean, it's freshest, I guess. Um, you know, there is something I like the best about it. I think it it holds together as a, as a, as a whole work a little better. It feels more focused in terms of the the lyrics and the, and the attitude and the sensibility. Um, but, um, I really, I really still, I mean, I'm, I still enjoy the, the other ones and there are actually four of, of this. This is the fourth of the songs. Um, and, um, but I like different ones for different reasons. That time on my hands is, I, I have the attention of putting the guitar in the forefront of that record. Um, I had been working with Steely for many years, and and Steely Dan work had given me an opportunity to develop a solo voice on the on, you know guitar, voice and uh, you know a way to improvise and a, a, something that felt more personal to me than I'd ever been able to put together with anything else. And I, of course, that was happening in my band as well, but for some reason, never, it had never gotten on a record in in a way that. Uh, that it seemed to naturally come out on to the end gigs. So before we made time on my hands, I really decided I really wanted to make a record that was in a way built around room for me to, to stretch a little on the guitar and to play longer solos and to play in a particular style. And that I had, you know, again, been working on and, and then I felt I had made some progress on. So, so I was going for a, you know, a certain kind of guitar tone on almost all the, the record and a similar tone on all the record and and I was going for songs that would allow me to stretch out a little bit and that was really the whole point of that I wanted to make sure that the that the songs didn't suffer as a result and I didn't want them to be just these kind of cheap vehicles for me to solo on but so we worked very hard to make sure the songs held up as songs but when we were done with that whole project and that was the last record before the, this new one um, I just didn't want to do that. It was it had been it was kind of a little unnatural to do that. I, I liked the way it came out and it, and it was good for me to stretch a little, but but I it was hard work and I didn't want to do another record like that. And I, I didn't plan to do another record. And when we started getting together and writing these tunes and they came out sort of naturally, they they came out as tunes that were really songs first again, which was more like I was used to writing. And uh, I had a, a blast putting guitar on those songs when, when I sat down to do it, but there was nothing premeditated about the kind of guitar sound or the kind of style or anything uh, in, in on adult entertainment. And in a way, it, it feels the most natural or, or spontaneous. And, uh, and again, the, because the songs were designed as songs first, with no thought about another agenda, like you know playing guitar and presenting myself as a guitarist in a certain way, they, had a, they have a kind of... A, you know, uh, an easy sort of natural and fun appeal to me. So, uh, 
So yeah, I mean that, that's what I'm li- that's what I'm liking about that record. But I but I love uh, the time on my hands. Feels like a real document of a certain kind of thing that I uh, was sort of proud to be able to get together. And I, you know, I think it's well represented on that record. So so I like that one for that reason. You know, it's so they're they're like different children. You know, you don't you get to like. <laughs> What's what's good about them and uh, accept their uh, their quirkiness, you know? <laughs> Whatever. Right. Totally. Well, what's the best way for folks to pick it up? Amazon. Well, the best way is probably to go to my website because we have a store tab on, on my website. Which, if they think in threes, they'll get the spelling right: J O N H E R I N G T O N dot com. And uh, it's it's there, and that's that's the best thing for me if they if they go right to the store to buy it because then they can see everything else that's available there. But of course, it's available on Amazon, I'm sure, on uh, on iTunes, on CDBaby.com. Um, yeah, I guess that's about it. Yeah. The All places right. everybody shops for it, and and you know, I think you can you can probably find it on YouTube and Spotify now, and you know, everywhere. It's it's it it should be easy to find. All right. Well, thank you so much, John. Jason, thank you. Great to talk to you.